Okay. I, I want to thank um, uh, the Bedford Playhouse so much for, for hosting this wonderful event. And I think we want to give a round of applause to our directors of this wonderful film because you guys just knocked it out of the park. So thank you. Thank you, thank so, you so much. much. Yeah. And having um, being familiar with your Oscar nominated um, film Traffic Stop, your documentary, I know that you care passionately about this whole issue of law enforcement and race and how they interact. But I want us to start off um, because I want to give an idea of that I want something for all of us to be thinking about right now. Because I think when we come to this issue, um, we probably come with some experience or emotional baggage or um, any kind of encounters that we might have had with law enforcement, no matter what background we come from, whether we are from um, the Northeast, whether we are from Texas, whether we are African American or white or Latino, whether we are male or female, um, wealthy, not wealthy. And um, I'm just going to throw something out there because I want the audience to be thinking about this. And then I'm going to ask Kate and David this question. But um, my first encounter with police was when I was about five years old. And um, my brother was seven at the time. And he was pulling me in, in a little red wagon um, down, uh, down, our, down our street that we had just moved to in um, southern Westchester. And we were the first African-Americans, of course, back then we were black, um, first blacks in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, and um, within, I'd say, five minutes of us being on the street, um, it was a quiet street, um, the police came. And the siren was on, and the lights were on, and the police officer um, stopped um, in front of us and said to, Richard, to my brother and I, um, where did you kids steal that wagon? And... Um, We'd never encountered, we'd never been in contact with a police officer before. And we, um, my brother said, this is ours. We live right over there. He says, you don't live in this neighborhood. And he took the wagon and put it in this trunk. And, um, and I, I got into the car crying because I didn't know what to do. And um, my brother was arguing with him until my mother happened to hear the, the sirens and people came out of their homes. And my mother ran down the street and said, what are you doing? We live here. And um, so that was my first encounter with the police. And of course, that was many years ago. But even as recently as two years ago, um, my daughter, I picked her up from Horace Mann School where my kids were attending at the time. And we were driving through Bronxville up the Sprain. And we were stopped by an unmarked car and did not know that this was a police officer. And um, the lights came on in the grill. And then we pulled over to the side. And he came to the passenger side, as I noticed that he did um, in Sandra Bland's car, and he knocked on the window. And my daughter at the time was 14, and we were scared because we didn't know who this was. There was no, um, he was un un not uniformed, and he was in shirt sleeves, and the car was not any kind of specially marked car. So um, he kept knocking on the window, and I said, who are you? I put down the back window behind her, and I said, who are you, and what do you want? And he said, put down the window, put down the window. And I wasn't going to put it down because I said, I said, come around to my side. What do you want? And who are you? Who are you? And he never identified himself and slowly walked around. And then he saw the badge on my um, dashboard that I happened to be chairman of the county police board. And he says, oh, my gosh, I didn't recognize you. I've seen you on television, News 12. And um, I said, but why have you stopped me? Because at this point, my daughter's crying. And um, he said, well, I saw um, the, the shiny badge, and I saw the car, and I just want you to know who this was. And, and this was the issue. Maybe it's because I'm driving a 550 Mercedes. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. The issue was, and I know that my kids, two years before that, were saying that I had this antiquated view about race and that it didn't matter and that their generation doesn't see color. But I, I just bring this example because that's how I come to your story here. And the reason why I, I, I started off with that is I went to ask, were there certain ideas that you had in mind already, an, an idea of, of this distrust between the police and race? And the, was that an issue that you already knew was in existence, or were you exploring it and hoping that you wouldn't find that? I was just wondering, what did you come to, informed obviously with your traffic stop film, um, that probably informs some of your opinion, but I'm just wondering, what were your views when you started this research on this on this on this story of Sandra Bland's? Hmm. Go ahead. You want to start? Oh, okay. I'll I'll go first. Well, you know, my my, my 
earliest experience with, with police were, were nothing like yours, right? I was, I was a child of some privilege in New York City, and the cops were just there to help me, and that was it. And, and you know, it took me 30 years before I figured out that it wasn't like that for everybody. Um, that they're really Hold it. Um, what, what, what really turned me around is when I, I used to be a lawyer before I was a filmmaker. Wow, you really got to be close. All right, is, is that is that better? Yeah. Okay, I'll really, <coughs> I'll, I'll really do it. Um, so, uh, this really is hard to do, though. Let's see. I'll switch it out. This is better. Okay, I'll just. I'll, I'll, okay. So anyway, I, I became a lawyer and I became a prosecutor in New York City, and I got to watch the criminal justice system up close, and I saw the incredible racial inequities that were going on day in day out. And after about three and a half years, I left and said, I got to change the criminal justice system. I, I just can't work in it anymore. And I became a writer and then a filmmaker. So this has been, this is my beat. This kind of injustice has been motivating me and making me angry and making me want to see change for most of my life. Um, and then so we, Kate and I have made a lot of films. Um, but in the last three years, we made this film called Traffic Stop, which you know, got nominated for an Academy Award and was about also driving while black. And it, it just blew my mind. It, it was a story of a 26-year-old African-American school teacher who had never been arrested. Also yeah. in Texas. Was it also Texas? Also in Texas. Right. In Austin. The, the supposedly the, the blue dot, right, in the red right. state. The, yeah. The well, liberal town. You know. <laughs> but, uh, it was, she's driving along, and, and basically the cop stops her, and he, she refuses to put her feet back in the car immediately. And, and I mean, when I say immediately, with three seconds later, he hauls her out of the car and body slams her. And it's all caught on dash cam, and she's traumatized. And, and I'm looking at this going, you know, this is just horrible. And in, I'll just give it quite just a little bit more, which is when we toured with both Traffic Stop and Sandra Bland, we, um, we played, played the films in places like St. Louis, where it's an all-black audience. And the audience response is, the, everyone has a story like that. Then we play in places like northern Maine, where it's a white audience, tend to be a little older than middle, middle age. And their response is, I can't believe that still goes on in America. <laughs> and the point is, there are two Americas, uh, and racism is, is unfortunately alive and well, and making these films has, has given me a chance to see America much more up close, because we've traveled so much, and it's, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to bring it to, to Bedford. But so that, that's, the, that's what I bring to this screening right now. This brings, brings you up to date. Thank you. And Kate, yeah, can you? I mean, uh, we, it's Sandra, Sandy's story happened in the midst of many other very publicized cases of men who had been brought down by the police, um, like Trayvon Martin and, and Eric Garner and other names you all know, I'm sure. Um, and so this wasn't, you know, sort of what happened to her didn't shock me in the context of what was going on in 2015, and uh, it still goes on, but back then there, there seemed to be a, li a lot of publicity around those cases. Um, but what I l learned, perhaps more than I expected going into this story, is that you know women's stories had been swept under the rug, not told as much. And that very summer, there were other women who had been, you know, brutalized by the cops for minor infractions on the side of the road, ended up dead or h even hung in their jail cells. Eerily similar. They just didn't make the headlines. So Sandy, for me. Um, thanks in part to her videos where she, we could all get to know her a little bit as a person um, with immense charisma and humor and insight and passion um, and courage. She s could speak for the dozens and hundreds of people whose names we'll never know. That's very interesting because I was going to ask, you have, a, you have a subject, an individual who is very um, vocal. And, but not just vocal, but you have her video, you have her tapes. I was wondering to what extent have, did you become close to, and what was your relationship with the family? Like, do you, are you still in touch with them? Because I'm sure you end up living, almost living their lives during the amount of time that you have to spend with them. I guess, as we saw from Chicago to, to back and forth to Texas, and obviously visiting with, to the, her grave at the cemetery. Um, to what extent do you feel that you grow close to your subjects. I mean, like with the Blands, but also similarly to the sheriff, for example, because I was surprised at the end that the sheriff actually admitted that there was wrongdoing on their part, that there was, that there was blame and fault there. But 
of course, that didn't change the fact that, 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 that no one was charged, or at least in the end, that all um, charges were, were dropped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, it, d it did take a while to establish trust. I think they decided early on when they met us that they would, um, they, they looked at our work. They, we sort of put our hearts on the table and said we're with them no matter how long this takes. And meanwhile, all these new stories were coming out. This is just the backstory. Of why, why, if I can speak for them, since they're not here, but I've heard them a lot, um, that that the story was being written for them, you know, in the press, and it wasn't necessarily accurate. And so they jumped in and said, you know, we better tell a story, and we trust you'll tell our, you know, you'll help. Us a voice. We weren't going to come in and narrate and you know because lay they a heavy hand. Confidential yeah. meetings, like, yeah. like the like the attorney meetings where they were saying, "Here's what our strategy is going to be." That yeah. must right. be. They That's must have at that crazy. point really have uh, un trusted your what you were going to do with that information. Yeah. Well, you know, we we came to the family two weeks after Sandy died, and the family. I mean, you know, you, as you, I'm sure you all remember when this story broke, it was, it was international news. It was a firestorm of press surrounding the family. And they had just lost you know, a daughter, a sister, under highly suspicious circumstances. So not only were they grieving, they were, they were, they were grappling for answers, and they weren't getting information, and uh, hounded by reporters. And you know, HBO called us up and said, you, this is your kind of story, guys. Do you want to see if you, they'll talk to you? And I, I remember thinking, yeah, but couple of white people from the East Coast. <laughs> and under these circumstances, you've got to be kidding me. And amazingly, they called us back, and I met, and I remember the turning point when we started to build their trust was Canon Lambert, the, the attorney, sure. um, the, the wonderful Canon Lambert. I have to, he and I have become really good friends. In fact, we're, I have to say, I can, I'm proud to say that we're very close to the family still to this day. Um, we really embrace each other and consider it like family. Um, but Canon looked to me and he said, look, we don't know what's going to happen. If it turns out that we can't prove that she was murdered by someone's hand, you know, what, what, what do you think the chances for your movie are? And I said, we're, we're in. We're in all the way. She shouldn't have been there in the first place. You know, she was brought down by the police. If, the, if everyone had behaved correctly, Sandy would still be here. So and, and in fact, she was arrested based upon a lie. I, guess, I mean, yeah. as far as what he was saying, that he felt threatened. And um, if that truly was a lie, then he never would have had reason to, to have her in the jail. I was exactly. actually going to ask you, was it hard to get access to all of the videotape? Because it seems, I mean, some of it, I guess, was exculpatory I mean, from the standpoint of the jail. But yeah. we never, ever saw anyone go down that hall during when, I, I think he said, like 100 and some hours of, of videotape. Right. Well, no, I mean, the nice thing about working, we worked under a non-disclosure agreement. And essentially, we, we, as far as the public was concerned, there was no film being made. You know, we, we, were, we never allowed ourselves to be seen in public with the family because we didn't want to hurt the chances of them finding out the truth. That was the, that was the goal. You know, we were what just there to document. And, sorry? What do you mean, them finding out the truth? Oh, sorry, the, 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 the chance of the public knowing that, well, we hurt the chance of the family finding out the truth. If the public sensed that the family was engaged in making a film it could have been used theoretically to tar their tarnish their reputation. Some way they were interested in publicity rather than in the truth. So we had to not exist. So as a result, the good side of that was we got all we got access to everything that they had, including you know, they subpoenaed the tapes from the jail, and we got those tapes. Got it. Because I was wondering, do you perceive as documentary filmmakers? Is your do you see your role as being like journalists trying to find new information? or to, 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 to show um, and reveal that that's already been found by other journalists? What do you feel, what is your role in that? Um, in oh no, we want, to, we want to find stuff that nobody else has found, um, for sure. We want to tell a story that's, that's unique. Um, but the truth has got to be the one pole star. And that, that was the one answer I had to, to Cannon when he said, you know, what, what, what'll happen if, if you, know, you find out we can't prove that Sandy was murdered? But I said to him, look, I said, on the, on the flip side, whatever else happens, we're going to, you know, it has to, we can't just tell a story that you want to have out there. We have to find out what really happened. And, and that was what brought us to the sheriff and brought us to the district attorney. Uh, because one of the things I'm really proud of in this film is that we got both sides of this story. You may not like what they have to say. You may not like them as people, but that's who they are. Right. And, and did they know that you were also... Um, speaking and working so closely with the family, interviewing them as well, or did they think that you were um, 
just speaking to law enforcement? Did they have any sense of No, what we had told them that we were, uh, that we had been filming. Right. Um, we couldn't uh, really approach them until after the case was settled. Right. Um, so that was largely because their, you know, the, a film could have really messed up the case. It wouldn't have helped either side. It would have prolonged, I don't know, there'd be a mistrial maybe. We didn't know if there was going to be a trial. It could still be going on. So we had to sort of lay low. Um, and I think part of the reason they chose to be on camera is because they felt vilified um, by the media and by the public. And um, that, that who felt they, vilified? Oh, the, the sheriff and the, the, sheriff, okay. and the DA. Yeah. yeah. Despite I, the fact that they were releasing information about Sandra Bland that that really undermined her character. Oh, but, but don't this forget is, the people yeah. breaking into the jail, right? Right. Okay. Threatening I their mean, lives. I, I, and, you know, I am they're crazy I, for them too. Everything. I agree that there are just many holes in, in many directions on this, but <laughs> but but nevertheless, they are being called. Just if you can just bear with me and put yourself in their shoes, they're being called murderers. Now let's just say they aren't. Let's just right. say they didn't go in. We will never know. Um, that's a big charge, you know, for right. for a ma sort of mass public to make, and and so they w were like, look, just tell us what you think. We're going to put in the film. You guys get hopefully, you learn more by hearing and seeing who they are than not, um, and then the film also allows for people to have, I th I hope, a more in-depth, educated discussion about kind of multiple points of view. And that's what Sandy was about. I mean, we took our cue a lot from Sandra Bland's own tapes, where she said, we have to hear each other. We have to listen to each other. She is, there's so much we would have, I would have loved to have included here. That's what, my big what ended up on the uh, cutting room floor? Well, what ended uh, up on the cutting room floor that you said, gosh, I wish we had had time, you yeah. know, to have the extra time to actually put that in, but HBO said we have to cut, you know, to a certain <laughs> like, what, what, what was something that you felt that you wish you, you had been able to keep in the film or or uh, was there anything well I mean it's Sandy's tapes I think I, I wish there were more of her just we she does have the opening and the closing lines she does guide us all the way through with her wisdom but there you know she is a whole you know she is San, Sandy speaks videos on just dealing with the police and educating young kids she was passionate about helping kids um, Learn how to cope with, you know, it's police. So as you're saying about your ironic and 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 actually oh. informative. Mm -hmm. I know that an organization that that my kids and, and I grew up in, Jack and Jill, which is an African American um, organization, has been around since the 1930s. We regularly teach the kids starting at like around seven or eight, how to inc deal with law enforcement if you're stopped by police. And these are all well-to-do, you know, suburban kids. Yeah. And what to do with security people, you know, rules. I mean, I've been like, we told our kids when they're growing up, no hoodies, no sunglasses, no baggy pants, you know, Chappaqua, whatever. It doesn't matter where, where you are. Uh, it's just that color for many people is a cultural shorthand for like what's dangerous and what's safe. And, um, but I was, I was wondering for, for, for yourselves, did you ever, did, did you ever feel questioned by the family or by African Americans that you had to interview that, you know, um, are you as a white person going to understand our story? Was there any sort of suspicion or worry or concern that y you encountered um, from any of your subjects? Well, not during the filming so much. It was after the film was made. I, I got taken to school a couple of times by uh, Miss Geneva who's Sandy's mom, Right. because um, I, I, I got up, you know, and the main thing is you got to admit when you mess up, and you got to be willing to learn, and that's when, you know, that's how I think ultimately we became close, is because we, we, we would just cop to stuff, you know, I'd be not just wouldn't get my back up, so but we did a, a Q&A, and I, I said, man, I went down to meet with the family in, in Texas, and Cannon, I said, I, you know, Cannon Lambert, he can be a scary guy, you know, and, and afterwards the family said, look, you're talking about like a big black man. It's, this is like a white guy calling him scary. Like, no, you're sending code. You may not even mean it, but watch your language. Think more carefully. Choose your words. And I went, got it. Um, she raised five daughters, you know. She, yeah. She, as, you know, you I'm sure. But, you know, because she felt so real. And um, I think for, for, for at least for me, and I don't know how the audience is about to open um, questions and comments from the audience, but... For me, she was a character that, um, in, in obviously a real person, but but had the characteristics of someone who was a survivor, but yeah. also someone who said, "I don't want I don't want to focus on what happened, but what's going to happen now?" That she was going to say, and as she said to those young people when she was sitting there with the Congressional Black Caucus, 
it's your job to make sure that she didn't die in vain. So right. I don't know if that was something that you intended, um, but it, it certainly came through in the, in, the, in the movie. Oh, great, great, That's great. Yeah. yeah, and I just want to say that, um, you know, regarding your question about how we were questioned, yes, some people certainly, you know, wondered wh who are we to tell this story? And I really had to think very hard about that, you know, and I, I guess I just it came around to feeling like, you know, we, we were, given this opportunity and I'd rather spend my life and skills and energy trying to, to open up people's minds and tell stories that I think are incredibly important than not. That doesn't mean that there shouldn't be other films on Sandra Bland, absolutely. Um, and so also, you know, we'd, we're, David has a history of being very, you know, critical and, and upfront about the justice system and so he had that kind of insight. I'm not sure we would have gotten to um, some of the law enforcement side, or just even hearing them with all the th their justifications and what they have to say, if you hadn't had that legal background. So do we make a certain pair, you know. I, I have a history of just telling the stories of all kinds of marginalized groups. Um, and so during the, the sort of release of this film and touring with it, what's slowly dawned on me, I guess I'm a slow learner, is that to me, just personally, this feels less and less like a black story. It is our nation's story. This is all of us who will participate in a system, whether we're aware of it or not, that's incredibly, you know, um, unjust, that, 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 you know, treats, that has incredible sort of like embedded disparity in the way that, that we perceive the world, you and know. And when I drive, if I see a cop in the rear view mirror, I'm afraid of getting a ticket. I'm never, it's never occurred to me to be afraid for my life. Never occurred to me. It's crazy. So as we take this out, I kind of feel like, you know what, this, this, Sandy was all about like we need to work together as a whole. And if, if I start, I don't know, I feel like it, if this is almost marginalized as a black story, then, then we won't, you know, harness the energy as much as we could of, you know, people from all different groups, right. you know. I, I, you, I think that's an excellent point because that was something she said um, that we can all be racists, you know, whether we are black or white, it doesn't matter, no one owns the license for that. And um, I, I think that what you've done here, and I, I want the audience to be able to have a chance now to ask some questions, but um, I, I do want to say that I think that you really have managed to, not just choose a figure that many people um, could identify, not necessarily identify with, but, but who, who was accessible because of the way and the friendly manner in which she talked about the simplest of things and was so consistent with it. Uh, and uh, I, I've heard people say things like, well, she shouldn't have mouthed off to the police officer. And you know, there's always some explanations for why. And I always tell my kids, you know, I have this new rule that when you start driving, you know, we're gonna put the registration and the insurance above on the <laughs> visor. So there won't be any reaching for anything. We don't want anything like that. But I think that what you've, the detail that you have made sure, because those sisters were absolutely amazingly yeah. articulate about the specific um, concerns that they had and the reasons why they felt that their sister could not have committed suicide. The, the questions that they asked, and there was great um, trust clearly that they had in you that they would reveal their most inner feelings when they would go back to the, to the grave, and I, I think yeah. that was done wonderfully. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. So let's, let's open up for questions. Okay, well, I guess I gotta ask, let my wife ask the question since she's <laughs> gonna be driving me home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for such a beautiful film. And as a black woman, I, I really appreciate the sensitivity with which you portrayed both Sandra, but also her family, her mother, her sisters, all of that really felt true to me. Yeah. So two, two questions. Um, one is that obviously this incident occurred in 2015 and then there was an election in 2016. And I wonder if you picked up any sort of early indicators of where the country was going in terms of that election as you were doing this work. Because everybody seemed so very caught off guard and so surprised at the outcome of the election and yet you were at the cold face. So my first question is did you pick up any kind of early tremors of what was to come with the 2016 election. The second one is if the Justice Department had been run 
by a different president and a different attorney general, do you believe that this case would have gone differently? Would the federal government have intervened in any way if a different regime had been in place in the Justice Department in 2016? Wow, okay, uh, I mean, the first one is no, I was just as clueless as everybody else and sat on my hands and thought we were gonna sail into Hillary land and, and that was that. Um, I mean, I should have known, there were definitely warning signs, but they were more like, I, in, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and there's a 50 year old white woman named Janet Jackson, she's a real estate agent in my building and she said, who are you voting for? And I said, Obama, and I said, how about you? And she said, she said, Trump. And I said, you're joking, right? She said, no, I'm voting for Donald Trump, why? because we need a, we need a strong man in the White House and Hillary, she might get her period and, and set off an atomic bomb. And I, I, said, I said, but she's postmenopausal. She goes, that doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, but the, the, the point being, so no, I, I just sailed in like everybody else. Um, <laughs> sorry for the digression. But, um, um, you know, the Justice Department, the FBI did get involved to a certain degree, but the Justice Department did not. Had they really wanted to be more aggressive about it, I think, I think, there would have been an investigation into why, ultimately, Brian Insinia was never charged with anything. I mean, like he's, he's really the linchpin. He, Brian Insinia is the police officer who, who pulls Sandy over, and when you said she shouldn't have mouthed off, which is true, she shouldn't have, that's not, not even remotely an excuse for how... Language when he said, I'm going to light you up as if, like, no, he's going to No, it's not even remotely an excuse. Right. And, and actually, if you, if you watch, you know, we, we, as you can see, there's one section of the film where we say five minutes and 44 seconds later. If you watch the first really 10 minutes of that encounter, Sandy does everything absolutely by the book. But he keeps coming back at her and egging her on and egging her on, and eventually she snaps. And, and so you have to understand that she really did play by the playbook for quite a long time, and everyone had their breaking point. Um, and yeah, I, I wished, to, that's, what, that's why the closing cards of the film are, are, are so dark, be, because it is astonishing to me that when a case is this clear cut, and also, as someone who is taken into custody of authority and comes out dead three days later, um, and there isn't a thorough examination of every single bit of protocol that allowed that to happen, is, is, is you know, is, oh, something is seriously wrong. And, and I wish something had been done in greater detail. Unfortunately, that's not the story that we encountered. Other questions? Yes. I Hi, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold, so I might sound a little stuffy. But um, a few years ago, I think in 2012, there was a documentary on the Central Park Five, and now recently, Ava DuVernay has made When They See Us, and now everyone is up in arms about a case that's 30 years old. And I'm not sure if it took um, a real life movie um, to finally portray it, where people understand what happened, but do you, do you, I know this film has been out for, I think, a month now or so. Actually, about a year we premiered at so year, Tribeca. So, I apologize. Yeah. That's okay. Um, and again, came out and there was a lot of um, talk about it for a while. There were a lot of interviews. Nothing necessarily big happened. Do you think it's going to take someone to make a feature film about her life for this to be a bigger deal than it is? Okay. I, th I th think that might be... Um, a good idea, and I, th um, yes, certainly have thought of doing such a thing. Um, I mean, it's interesting how many people here were aware of the recent news coverage because of the release of her cell phone video. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that will only help keep her story um, you know, remembered. Um, unfortunately, it just really wasn't enough to there wasn't enough new information to open, reopen the case, uh, despite what CNN and other people said. But, yeah. um, but thank yeah. you, yeah. yeah. I, he I, I hear I, what I you're I saying, I and it is I amazing that the Central Park Five case happened 30 years ago. That's incredible. Yeah. Donald Trump played a role in that, too. It's interesting. Yes, I had actually did. forgotten about that. He had taken out the full-page ads um, and was asking for the death penalty for, for these five boys who were all, I think it was like 15, 16 years old, and then in the end, they were innocent. And yes, but it and just shows how that people's guilty, lives are destroyed. Yeah. He still maintains that they're guilty. He still does. Yeah, Donald I will never admit his faults. <laughs> Thank you for the yeah. film. It was great. I'm wondering about the plastic bag. I don't know how tall Sandra was. And I was trying to figure out how she would have gotten up there to tie that so perfectly yeah. over 
that and he said well she was probably sitting well was there a chair in there or was there how much discussion or investigation on that loop or how that would have been done or any investigation discussion with whomever took her down they said took her down yet i think there was a mention that she might have been sitting because of the way so to me i didn't understand right were you allowed to go into that cell and examine that area well not not the news because we we, we were allowed into right. the cell and spent quite a bit of time there um and first of all i gotta Question. tell you uh, i, I c there are n innumerable details about this which will send you you know, to the refrigerator at 3 o'clock in the morning going, why didn't they? And Kate and I, as we were making the film, kept thinking, we got it. No, we're we going to solve it. this. We got <laughs> this. For example, in, in the picture of the, of the noose, there's another bag in the trash bag already. Well, how could there be another bag in the trash bag already? Right. Right. All, all these things. And I would call Cannon Lambert up and say, Cannon, have you thought of this? You thought of this? You know, <laughs> thinking I'm going to solve the case. He goes, yeah, we thought of it. Here's, and so <laughs> I, I'll tell you, to, to save you trouble, there are answers to those very questions you asked, but Bottom line is there, there are unfortunately answers that don't help solve the case. What the, the reality, she, Sandra was found um, in a kneeling position with her head in a noose. Yes, people actually can and do commit suicide that way. Astoundingly, I didn't know, but they, then the woman who they brought in, it was not, it's not mentioned in the film, but the woman, Dr. Carter, who was brought in, um, not only is she an African-American woman and, and felt very passionately that what happened to Sandy was, was horrible, uh, but she used to be the chief medical examiner for Harris County, which is where this was t which took place. So she used to run that office. So if anybody knows what, what shortcomings to look for, she did. And she couldn't find anything be more damning than what she found. I mean, my take, just people ask all the time, you know, what, what do you think, quote, really happened? And I mean, first of all, we'll never know what really, really happened because there was, there was no camera in that cell. And the, ca the cameras that go show who can enter and exit that jail cell are motion activated. They don't just film continuously. So if nothing's happening, they turn off. Then some motion comes, they turn back on. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to put a piece of paper up in front of it. Yeah, and, you know, right. exactly. so, so and they're so not you'll never know. time stamped, I'm sure. Right, they're not time stamped. So, so since you don't know, my, my feeling is Sandra was lynched. You know, here's a woman who wasn't doing anything, gets pulled out of her car at Taser Point, beaten up, w without a doubt, she was beaten up by the side of the road hauled into jail, had a bogus felony charge slapped on her, put in jail for $5,000 bail, um, and was left in solitary confinement for three days against all aspects of jail protocol. And never checked because they said it yeah. was all blank and the person just kept signing They lied. They, they lied. They, committed, they, they, they submitted forged documents to show about how she, how she was checked on. And so, you know, she was th the best thing you could possibly say is that she was driven to emotional despair by being beaten up, falsely charged with the prospect of going to jail for quite a long time for beating up a police officer in Texas um, and left to think about it for three days in solitary confinement. Um, that's the best you could possibly, that's the best spin you can put on this. The worst spin is that someone came in there and, you know, or at least another very dark spin is that someone came in there and strangled her and made it look like a hanging. Um, either way, there's no way around the culpability that attaches. So, regard, you know, the fact there's no DNA on the noose, there are explanations for that. Uh, ultimately, this is a case of someone being killed, if you will, by a white criminal justice system. And I, I submit it, it began because she was a black woman well, did talking they have back an to authority. explanation for why there was no DNA if it had been around her neck? Did well, they say okay, so, it so this cleaned or wiped right. clean? Or? Well, it's a mystery, and, okay. and it, it still um, bedevils canon. You know? um, and remember that just if there's no DNA, it really could be that it was wiped, and because it doesn't make sense, it's sweaty, hot jail. We right. were in there, trust me, there's no air conditioning. This is Texas in July. Um, and... Um, then again, if you sort of go down the rabbit hole of what could have happened, you know, maybe guards rushed in, took her down, um, and then said, uh-oh, maybe they're going to get in trouble, and so they wiped it. You know, that doesn't mean they killed her. So it's incumbent upon Cannon, you know, and the, the attorneys who are defending Sandra Bland's family to prove murder, and this is the issue. And so because he couldn't... He, prove murder, he had to kind of go with the suicide. Um, right, right. Well, we heard that. He was right, and that so he was, he, he, right. exactly. he was a bit trapped. Other questions, yeah. yes. 
Wait, 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 wait. Okay, Mike. If she drove her car from Chicago, mm -hmm. was her license plate from Illinois? It was an Illinois plate, yeah. That, to me, speaks to what happened. Yeah. I know. Smart I ass northern person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll take that. To, yeah, I totally think you're, you're on. Her. The fact also that if you look at what happened is Officer Insinia noticed her car drive by. He turns around and then starts following her. And I would submit that if, her, if she had had Texas plates, he might not have done it. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very I mean, one of the I, yeah, I'm I glad really you said that because that. one of the things we d early on started framing the filming as, I mean, it, visually, is we, as you could see, Chicago is almost like a character in the film. There's a lot of Chicago and a lot of Texas. And so it's a north-south dichotomy, too. I also think gender, you know, is a right, whole yeah. part of this. So that she was too confident and, and spoke, you know, was not going to be passive and say, oh, I'm sorry, officer. And um, I think that, uh, that I'm sure. And well, class, she's really educated. She absolutely. knew her rights. She said, well, exactly. right. I don't and have to put out my up cigarette. Well, because <laughs> he didn't even want the bystander, I think. Wasn't he telling the bystander, you, you need to go? I mean, I think that right. he was taping, videotaping yeah, he did. what was going on. You know, and, and that's when you say she was well-spoken, one of the things we were really excited about from the minute we met Cannon and, and Sharon and Shante and Geneva was to do a documentary film to put a, a realistic and, and deeply respectable face on black America. There, you know, I hate to say it, but the images of black Americans in documentary films tend to be really of... of you know, ghetto dwelling, uneducated people, which is which is bullshit and 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 misrepresent misrepresentative. And so we were really excited right. that Cannon and Sandy Stanley were just such amazing the, people. The, all those family members were good yeah. spokespeople well, for just, yeah, the issue. Well, they're we, a we facet of society that are. has yet that just right. isn't right. is underrepresented. Uh, absolutely. There was questions in the back. Yes. Uh -huh. It's tempting to see. Something like it's tempting as a northerner to see this as um, you know um, shining a light on, on what goes on in, in South, but um, it, it risks um, hiding what we have to face ourselves. Um, I'm currently working on it with a team on the case of a, um, a young black man who was sleeping in his own home when an ex-girlfriend broke into his home and attacked him, and there were witnesses, and she was punished, and um, she um, has since then, in spite of being punished, has gone on to accuse him of the crime over and over and over. This happened in 2013, hiding behind feminism. So what do you do when the racist hides behind feminism? You know, I need to know the details of that yeah. case. I, I, I um the devil's always in the details. I hate to be have sound like a lawyer about it, but but you are. We all are. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> guilty as charged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um. Other. Yes. Did anybody talk to the, to the bystander as to what they might have seen before they started yeah. taking the? Yeah, the do we know who video? the bystander was? We, we, we just posted on YouTube. No, we actually did track down. Can track down the bystander. Um, and um. You know, I think he just happened to be there, and what you saw is what he saw. And we thought about interviewing him, but frankly, he's not really a character in the story. I mean, his best role is that he caught that. He was brave enough to catch it, but to bring him as, in as a character seemed a bit irrelevant. But no, I don't think there's much more to that. Yeah, thanks. No, I just want to ask a quick question. Um, do you ever find yourself, because I saw it was obvious that your absence from the film, when I think of like, let's say, like a Michael Moore documentary, mm -hmm. he is always a character in the film. I mean, do you ever, in any of your work, do you put, put yourselves in there, and or is that intentionally not done? I mean, for me, it just depends. It has to feel really natural. Okay. If, if, I mean, there, I, have, I have done it before, okay. when I was very, yeah. Yeah, actually in two films. Um, but it was in a scene where something really ha it happened that just, it, it would help the audience feel more comfortable to understand that there was an interchange between the filmmaker behind the camera and the... Yeah. Here it really, oh my gosh, we had enough to handle without us being in it. I mean, because it's a, it's a really complex story told from multiple points of view. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, outstanding film. 
I'm interested in a digital uh, social media aspect of this. I'm concerned that she was additionally targeted for her videos. I'm concerned that the police may have Googled her and then treated her even more badly because of these videos. And you end your movie with, can you hear me? With yeah. this, the words, uh, silence, I think is the Silence is a new slave. Um, which I thought was very on point. Thank you. That's an excellent question because so much of what she was obviously um, um, w was, 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 was posting was all about police and um, law enforcement and its treatment of, of minorities. And so um, I hadn't even thought about the fact that they could have Googled her and would have found all of that and said, well, because obviously she was there for two to three days before she died. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, theoretically, they might have known her as well because she was a student at Prairie View and politically and active. how long was she gone in ch back to Chicago before she came back? Was that several years, wouldn't yeah, it have been? Yeah, a few years. Right. Three, right. Okay. I think three years right. okay. comes to mind. Yeah. Okay. But it's true. They may have known that they had a, t you know, a testy, outspoken person. Though from what we see in the videos of her in jail, the jailhouse um, monitor cameras, um, that she didn't seem all that... Um, Right, I mean, she seems Difficult. very reticent. I mean, almost cowering. I mean, <laughs> clearly fearful. Yeah, I think I think she felt that she had been really well. First of all, she was in physical pain. Right. Uh, and she was probably scared that you know they they got her. They had her beat. They were they char I mean, she was facing a felony charge, and it was going to be the word of Brian and Senia against her in court. That's a very frightening thing to contemplate as a lone black woman in, tech, in the heart of Texas when your right. family is thousands of miles away. Right, right. right. Um, right. How, how are we on time? Okay, family. yes, sorry. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Hold on. First, I want to say thank you for this very thought-provoking work that you've done. My thank question you. has you. to do with the marijuana, and I think, as the lady over here said, that there had to be a point at which they either Googled her or looked up her records and came up with her past, mm -hmm. looking at what she had accomplished, her abilities, her knowledge, because they then come up with whether or not she had attempted suicide, blah, blah, blah. And I think this is where they probably also picked up on her use of marijuana, because all of a sudden, that became an issue. Because if at the point when they stopped her, she had marijuana in her system, or she had been smoking, that would have been another charge. You know, she would have been charged Driving with under the influence. Yes, yeah, right, she, exactly. yeah. she would have been charged with the possession of marijuana, or under the influence, or driving under the influence. None of this came up until later on. And I'm just wondering whether or not any of that was uncovered, because it seems to me they made a big deal about the marijuana, but nothing ever came out until later on. And I think that was because they then delved into her history and mm. saw that she had had a previous issue with marijuana. Mm. You know, it, it could be. We've, we've asked questions like that to, to the prosecutor, to the sheriff, and you know, that's the kind of thing they're probably gonna take with them to their grave if it's true. Uh, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna say, oh yeah, let me give you the answer to that. Um, th with one person we really wanted to speak to and we never got to speak to, it's the one thing, uh, there isn't, isn't much from Sandy Speaks, I re deeply regret leaving on the cutting room floor, but the one that got away in this film is there's a guy named Michael Sergis who, who spoke to Sandy regularly in her jail cell. And he was the last person to speak to her alive. Was he someone from Chicago or? From no, he's from Texas. Okay. And, and um, we found out where he was working and we went every day and left our card and said, we really got to talk to you. And he just, he just, he just de dipped on us. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't reach him. Okay. So I, I would always wanted to know what, what she had to say in those last days. And I'm really sorry. Pardon me? He, he worked in the jail. He oh, was he worked he was in the jail. Yeah, oh, he was in jail. Yeah, he was right. a member of the police department. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't think we. I don't think you do. But the marijuana, you know, sort of the character assassination built around that was extremely effective. I mean, I remember when that came out, and people were like, "Well, she go. smoked." There's like, what? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's just right. look at the arrest. Like, what does this? Right. But it's so. So it's it's a, an extraordinary lesson in how um, public perception can be shaped by the smallest things. And ironically, as you see 
first, you know, firsthand um, during the autopsy findings that when the family meets, you know, there uh, wasn't a copious amount of marijuana in her system at all. Well, tell me this thing. You, you, they talked about death threats. I mean, both sides. Right. Um, I'm just curious from your own, I mean, the kinds of films that you do that are controversial, do you ever get threats or, um, you know, or requests or suggestions about like, if you if you come back here and try to do this film again or or, or continue to, 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 um, to, to talk about these issues? I mean, or do you ever find yourself the targets of those kinds of threats? Not, not yet. There's, w there's one film we made called The Newberg Sting you know, about from Newburgh, New York. There were four gentlemen from Newburgh who the FBI set up uh, as a quote-unquote terrorist ring. They didn't even know each other, and they sent an undercover informant to basically offer them $250,000 if they would just go along with this plot to plant a bomb. And they went along with the plot, and they, the FBI sent in bomb squads, and they created this elaborate ruse, and we, the, we did a film basically showing that the FBI had lied to Congress and lied to the public about this. And if you were making it, everybody said, oh, man, you're, you're never going to be able to fly internationally <laughs> again, you know. Um, and we flew internationally just fine and never got any extra pat downs and it was it's been okay. I have to say the First Amendment from our point of view is still alive and well. Got it. Very good. Okay, um uh, I how are we on time? Somebody help me out here. Um I think we could have Okay, okay, okay. So maybe um I, I think one question back there, I see way back there. Yeah. Okay, could that that'll be our last question and um we will then close down and thank our our wonderful directors here. Yes. It's good. Um, my first question, did you, did you try to talk to, yeah, Brian and Sinia? And then the second question is, we often hear about what we tell our sons if they encounter police, but through your work, since this is your beat, you know, are there any um, lessons that you've learned from the parents and the families that have to deal with the police? because we were struck by the fact that there was so much strength through, throughout their grief. And so, you know, is there a common thread among the families who then have to hit, deal with and handle um, law enforcement after the fact? Great question, great yeah. question. Thank you. Let me answer the first part right away. Brian, we did try to reach Brian and Senia, and he wouldn't speak to anybody. He, he's, um, he just, he, he basically hid from, from the public eye because when that video came out, uh, everyone just hated on him, and correctly so. Um, we did, you'll hear him talking a little bit about what he thought happened during that stop, but I was, she was, I didn't want her to have access to the console and was worried about the bag. My life had. was in danger. Yeah, my life was in danger. And that we got, we eventually obtained, I can't, as I sit here, I don't remember exactly how we got it, a tape recording of, an, of testimony that he had given to, a, to the police. Uh, and so we had his, uh, that's, uh, it is his voice explaining his side of the story, but we never got it directly from him. Okay. Yeah. Lessons that we have gleaned from this, you know. Um, You're talking about from other families. From other families. Between, I guess probably from like Traffic Stop, the other, the other film that you did, as yeah. well as this one. I mean, don't, right. give, don't give law enforcement any excuse. You know, there's no, you're, not, you're not trying to litigate the, the civil rights history of America at a red light, you know, or at a, at a, at a traffic stop. You, you're not going to win. I think the lesson I learned is you're never going to win in those encounters. You're, if, you, if you push back, you're always going to come out on the losing end, no matter how morally and legally um, badly the arresting officer behaves. You've got to fight it later. You can't, if you try to fight it then and there, you're, you're going to end up But I mean, in terms of in the trouble. families themselves, they also, they've come together and formed coalitions and, and you know, Sandy's sisters, Sharon and Shante are involved in many groups um, and they go to Washington and they go en masse and it's, it's one way to, I think I can't be in their shoes at all and I'm not trying to be, I mean, I'm not trying to, to say that, that I know what it feels like, but from what I've observed that, you know, if they can, band together and f form groups that have some political clout. Their stories are there. Well, you saw it. I mean, they're right. so passionate and so articulate, and it's not just this family. It's so many. Um, and they can affect change, and at least that helps them, at the very least, least feel like something good can come out of a tragedy. Well, I was going to say, you've yeah. given us hope in this film at the end because we, we see a family that says, okay, we're going to insist that there are um, right. There are videos in all of the all of the cells, right. 
and I think that also that one thing that you've given us hope about is the fact that we have to be able to speak about the relationship between law enforcement and communities because yeah. I think there is a lot of distrust on both sides. Right, and you know, sometimes it takes, I don't know, I'm curious what everybody here would think, you know, but um, it, to me, Sandy is a bit of a Rosa Parks that, you know, if somebody has to say, I won't sit in the back of the bus. Right. And she, as a result, made herself vul vulnerable, but it's because she's just, by her character is that she is an activist and she's, right woke and she wants to affect change and so she's going to speak out but she took the fall right. well you know, i want to thank i want to thank one because oh, yeah, this is actually one sort of call to action thing that everybody can do which 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 is, is this thing here you know one of the things that turned sandy's case around was that bystander video right. that's the only video where you see her face down it's the only video where you see her really being manhandled everything else the police are well trained to take take people out right, out of the view of the camera the camera when, yeah when, right so <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you for for taping this. Right, thank right. you. And, and so you know, that's, that's a lesson. You know, and that's something everybody can do. If you see something that's going on wrong, be be that be that guy who who took that video, who probably changed national perception about how this case was going to be received. Right. right. Excellent point. Well, I want to thank our guests. These, I feel like we're inside the director's studio here. <laughs> and I feel like James Lipton here. Thank you very much. But, but well, I want to thank, thank you, man. you, Kate and David. You have uh, just a marvelous talent and, and are very courageous. And I want to thank our audience. Thank you um, for coming on this yes, beautiful thank you day so much. for such a And I want to thank my friends. And I want to thank Saul yeah, Mill for supporting us. And thank you so much, Nicole, and, and this wonderful um, um, Bedford Playhouse for, for supporting um, wonderful films like this. And on behalf of the venue. Playhouse, thank thanks you, everybody. Thank you, Bedford Playhouse.